This is Late Night Classics with me, B.B. Jacob. I'll be reading you my selection of Greek and Roman classics to accompany you into the night. Welcome back, listeners. I have another gem from Book 8 of Ovid's Metamorphoses for you tonight. The story of Baucis and Philemon reads like a folk tale, not a Greek myth, but it clearly illustrates the ancient Greek notion of xenia, showing protection and hospitality to strangers. Baucis and Philemon There is, upon the Phrygian hills, an oak near to the lime tree, enclosed by a low wall. Not far thence is a standing water, formerly habitable ground, but now frequented by cormorants and coots that delight in fens. Jupiter came hither in the shape of a man, together with his son Mercury, the bearer of the Caduceus, having laid aside his wings. To a thousand houses did they go, asking for lodging and for rest. A thousand houses did the bolts fasten against them. Yet one received them, a small one indeed, thatched with straw and the reeds of the marsh. But a pious old woman named Baucis and Philemon of a like age were united in their youthful years in that cottage, and in it they grew old together. And by owning their poverty, they rendered it light, and not to be endured with discontented mind. It matters not whether you ask for the masters there, or for the servants, the whole family are but two, the same persons both obey and command. When, therefore, the inhabitants of heaven reached this little abode, and bending their necks entered the humble door, The old man bade them rest their limbs on a bench set there, upon which the attentive Baucus threw a coarse cloth. Then she moves the warm embers on the hearth, and stirs up the fire they had had the day before, and supplies it with leaves and dry bark, and with her aged breath kindles it into a flame, and brings out of the house faggots split into many pieces, and dry bits of branches, and breaks them, and puts them beneath a small boiler. Some pot herbs, too, which her husband has gathered in the well-watered garden, she strips of their leaves. With a two-pronged fork, Philemon lifts down a rusty side of bacon that hangs from a black beam and cuts off a small portion from the chine that has been kept so long, and when cut, softens it in boiling water. In the meantime, with discourse they beguile the intervening hours and suffer not the length of time to be perceived. There is a beechen trough there that hangs on a peg by its crooked handle. This is filled with warm water and receives their limbs to refresh them. On the middle of the couch, its feet and frame being made of willow, is placed a cushion of soft sedge. This they cover with cloths, which they have not been accustomed to place there, but on festive occasions. But even these cloths are coarse and old, though not unfitting for a couch of willow. The gods seat themselves. The old woman, wearing an apron and shaking with palsy, sets the table before them. But the third leg of the table is too short. A pot's hurt placed beneath makes it equal. After this being placed beneath has taken away the inequality, green mint rubs down the table thus made level. Here are set the double-tinted berries of the chaste Minerva, and cornel berries gathered in autumn and preserved in a thin pickle, endive too, and radishes, and a large piece of curdled milk, and eggs that have been gently turned in the slow embers, all served in earthenware. After this, an embossed goblet of similar clay is placed there, Cups, too, made of beech wood, varnished where they are hollowed out with yellow wax. There is now a short pause. 
The fire then sends up the warm repast, and wine, kept no long time, is again put on, and then set aside for a little time. It gives place to the second course. Here are nuts, and here are dried figs mixed with wrinkled dates, plums too, and fragrant apples in wide baskets, and grapes gathered from the purple vines. In the middle there is white honeycomb. Above all there are welcome looks, and no indifferent and niggardly feelings. In the meanwhile, as oft as Baucus and the alarmed Philemon behold the goblet when drunk off, replenish itself of its own accord, and the wine increase of itself, astonished at this singular event, they are frightened, and with hands held up, they offer their prayers, and entreat pardon for their entertainment and their want of preparation. There was a single goose, the guardian of their little cottage, which its owners were preparing to kill for the deities, their guests. Swift with its wings, it wearied them, rendered slow by age, and it escaped them a long time, and at length seemed to fly for safety to the gods themselves. The immortals forbade it to be killed, and said, We are divinities, and this impious neighbourhood shall suffer deserved punishment. To you, it will be allowed to be free from this calamity. Only leave your habitation and attend our steps, and go together to the summit of the mountain. They both obeyed, and supported by staffs, they endeavoured to place their feet on the top of the high hill. They were now as far from the top as an arrow discharged can go at once, when they turned their eyes and beheld the other parts sinking in a morass, and their own abode alone remaining. While they were wondering at these things, and while they were bewailing the fate of their fellow countrymen, that old cottage of theirs, too little for even two owners, was changed into a temple. Columns took the place of forked stakes, the thatch grew yellow, and the earth was covered with marble. The doors appeared carved, and the roof to be of gold. Then the son of Saturn uttered such words as these with benign lips. Tell us, good old man, and thou wife, worthy of a husband so good, what it is you desire. Having spoken a few words to Baucis, Philemon discovered their joint request to the gods. We desire to be your priests and to have the care of your temple, and since we have passed our years in harmony, let the same hour take us off both together, and let me not ever see the tomb of my wife, nor let me be destined to be buried by her. Fulfillment attended their wishes. So long as life was granted, they were the keepers of the temple, and when enervated by years and old age, they were standing by chance before the sacred steps and were relating the fortunes of the spot. Baucus beheld Philemon, and the aged Philemon saw Baucus too, shooting into leaf. And now the tops of the trees growing above their two faces, so long as they could, they exchanged words with each other and said together, Farewell, my spouse. And at the same moment, the branches covered their concealed faces. The inhabitants of Tyana still show these adjoining trees made of their two bodies. Old men, no romancers, and there was no reason why they should wish to deceive me, told me this. I indeed saw garlands hanging on the branches, and placed there some fresh ones myself. I said, the good are the peculiar care of the gods and those who worship the gods are now worshipped themselves. This isn't just a story about the custom or law of Xenia, hospitality. It's about Theoxenia, offering hospitality to the gods. And rather aptly, the patron of Xenia was Zeus Xenios, Zeus who protects strangers. I love this story. It both comforts me and reminds me of my own inadequacies. 
As a foolish young backpacker, I remember the extraordinary xenia I was shown in Chile by countless people who opened their doors and their homes to me and were as generous as Baucus and Philemon. Sadly, I once failed to offer Xenia in return. I'm lucky Zeus Xenios didn't punish me and make me sink into a morass. Forgive me, Zeus Xenios. I was young and ignorant. The translation of Ovid's tale was by Henry Thomas Riley, published in 1851 and now in the public domain. Late Night Classics is presented by me, B.B. Jacob. Sound and production by Jeff Chung.